Hi there, I'm Michael Hill with Canine Chronicle TV, and I'm here today with David Miller, a judge and lifetime dog person, and we're going to find out about his entire pathway through the sport of dogs. So let's start at the very beginning. How did you first get into dogs? Oh, wow, that's a, that's a very good question. You know, my mother had chihuahuas. Okay. And um, my father loved horses, and he had American uh, saddlebred horses. I had a Shetland po I was just surrounded by dogs all the time. We had a dog, uh, uh, a terrier, for many, many years until uh, she passed when I, uh, when I graduated from college. And that, yeah. so, you know, my, I've always had dogs around and uh, always had the company of dogs. And I was, I was the only child. So to have that dog... Yeah, and somebody to relate to and talk to, even though sometimes the dog couldn't talk back to me. It was <laughs> it was it was wonderful. It was. But just they give you looks. They give you feedback. <laughs> I'm sorry. But they give you looks. They give you feedback. It's like oh, a oh, certainly, certainly. They speak in other ways that are just incredible. I love that. Where did you grow up? Well, I gr I grew up in two places. My mother was French, so. Uh, did a lot of time, uh, spent a lot of time in France and also in Ohio and that. So it's two places that I grew up in. So I had the best of both worlds. That is amazing. And were either of your parents involved in um, showing or breeding dogs? No, they were not. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, things changed and... Um, uh, they couldn't get involved with the dog sport, and it wasn't until later on, uh, until I graduated from college, that um, I found out about dog shows, mm. and this really mystified me, and at that particular time, I was living in South Carolina, okay. and um, I went to one show, and I said, wow, this is incredible, and... Um, at that time, I didn't have any dogs, so my employer bought me an Afghan hound. <laughs> and I, um, in a matter of, it seems like a year, I had three Afghan hounds. No. Oh, yes. You know, I just <laughs> love them. And, you know, they, they, one was the well-bred Afghan hound bitch. And the other two were, were kind of rescues. I felt sorry for them, and I wanted to get them in a good home. And uh, uh, the first one was actually an import from Wales. Really? So, yes. So, I... Uh, so, you really was jumped Navy in with I was living in Charleston, South Carolina. A Navy person wanted to uh, go ahead and um, uh, find a good home for this dog. And I said, I'll, t I'll take the dog. I'll take the dog. And that, and wow. it was that was basically my start. But before before that, I was living in France for a while, and uh, I was doing some graduate work. And there, I had seen Salukis, mm -hmm. and I had really fallen in love with hounds. And yeah. uh, so I gravitated towards hounds when I came back to the United States, and I really wanted a Saluki. So I. I moved from Charleston, South Carolina to go up north to Ohio. And I don't know why with all the snow out there and looking at you right now. <laughs> I'm wondering that, what's the point of that, but okay. <laughs> right. And, and um, I said, you know, I want to get a Saluki and that. And I was very lucky, very, very lucky because one of the leading Saluki people of the United States lived about 30 miles away from me. And who was that? That was Esther Bliss Knapp of Pan, uh, Pine Paddocks Salukis. So she lived at that time in Valley City. And I uh, went and sat in one of her paddocks. And she brought dogs out to me. And, and uh, you know, she had some imports and that. And she wanted to place with me a, a Kuwaiti bitch. Very, very pretty. But I couldn't show her. So, I, I, you know, I wanted to get active in the dog show ring in that. So, yeah. um, much to her dislike, I went through another kennel in California. Okay. And that was Srinagar Kennel. And uh, that was uh, Winifred Lucas. Okay. 
and I got my first Saluki. Wow. A very diminutive male, party color. And I um, started showing him. And I finished him with two back-to-back -back majors <laughs> on the East Coast. And I was hooked. I was hooked. You were, you were done after that. I was. <laughs> I was. So we, you know, we went back to um, California. Okay. And um, we bought... Uh, a couple more dogs from Winifred and that, and we were very lucky to have one of the top 20 dogs uh, in the country, um, champion Srinagar uh, Rajendra. And um, I, um, I, I just blended into the dog show scene. And you know, in that time, and this is in the 70s, at that time, the entries, not for Saluki so much as for Afghans, were huge. Because you, you had very big Afghan breeders here in the northeastern Ohio. You had Ray Abrams, and I'm bringing up names that are, you know go yeah. far, far back. I love and, it. Keep uh, going. Yeah, it, it was just <laughs> incredible. So you you would sit around the rings and just look at this multitude of dogs that would come in, and you were able to be able to sharpen your eye and and that and then people would see me win with the salukis and i was a you know six foot six foot five i was svelte i could move around the ring with borzois <laughs> and afghans and, and salukis so people asked, started asking me to show their dogs Right. And uh, I was able to uh, finish uh, several Borzois. I handled Scottish Deerhounds. I handled Salukis for other people, just and it just it just <laughs> took off. It, it, it was incredible. Were you doing breeding as well? Yes, yes, we did breed as well, and uh, we we sent a lot of dogs to Europe. Mm. We sent a lot of dogs to South America. Uh, one in particular, uh, well, half my family is French, so I have family in France. And, and let me go into this story. This is very yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting, too. I, um, I went ahead and sent a Saluki mail to my family in Strasbourg, France. Okay. And there were people that rode their bicycles and jogged in the area of where they lived and they stopped and saw the Saluki because they knew about Salukis, but they were astonished about the temperament of this dog because this dog came right up to them. And you know, Salukis can be a little bit aloof. Sure. So um, they said, where, where did you get this dog? And uh, they took, they told them, and Josette Lucier, who was the person who who uh, uh, saw this dog, called me and said, "We want one of your Salukis." So I sent wow. her. Oh, actually, I accompanied the dog to France uh, for her, and um, and she took the dog, and the dog was like her daughter. She had wow. a son. And the son <laughs> felt like he was being left out because the dog got more attention than, than he did at times. So uh, she went ahead and got reserved best in show at the uh, Saluki specialty in France. And she oh became uh, a European coursing champion and won a very, very big coveted coursing meet in, uh, in, um, in Switzerland. That's amazing. And, um, so, you know, she she lived out her life with them, and then and she passed. And then uh, Josette and her husband Didier uh, moved to Morocco, and they missed Saluki so much. They said, "David, we want another Saluki. We want another Saluki." Well, at that particular juncture in my breeding program, I was interbreeding with a French kennel called Eric Burharis by Jean Louis Grunait, and um, I was at that time producing smooths and I had this beautiful smooth bitch cream colored lovely but you know she wasn't fitting the bill exactly as temperament wise as her other dog but I said you know I have her she'd be a wonderful home so I I flew with her to Paris and I took her to the uh, uh, 
let me see, the Gare de Lyon in, in, in Paris. Oh. And uh, Josette and Didier met me there, and then they, they took the dog away, and she just looked at me when, she, when they were leaving to get on the train, and then I was heartbroken. But oh. I was hoping that this would just work out well. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it didn't because they weren't used to that type of real type of Saluki temperament. So yeah. they called me up and said, David, it's just not working. And I said, well, you know, I've always made a commitment as a breeder that if it doesn't work out, I take their dogs back because I was not a pro prolific breeder Sure. because I wanted to make sure that the dogs were okay. And right. if I produce all these litters, I would never have been able to do that. And, and you probably know that Salukis are not the easiest dogs to place in homes. That was my next question. I was going to say, what was the market like for Salukis? Not very good. <laughs> not very good at all. <laughs> so uh, I, I ended up flying back to Paris. They met oh. me in Paris and, um, uh, and I took her back. And she lived with me until she passed, and she was 15 years old when she passed. I had Aww. her and her brother, and they stayed together with me in the house and, and so yeah. on and so forth. And it was wonderful and that. But, you know, at that time, you were looking at, in, in the breed, a lot of heart disease, a lot of autoimmune deficiency debris, uh, disease. And I really? wasn't quite sure whether I really wanted to continue a breeding program because to tell you the truth, every time they left, there, it, it, it took a chunk of my heart. Yeah. And, and, uh, it's so much work. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, and then it was really nice because I went back several times to Morocco with uh, to visit uh, Josette and Didier, and I got to know the uh, in Morocco very, very well. And later on, I ended up taking American um, tourists to Morocco because I had a friend in Paris who bought wow. a Riyadh in the Medina in Mar Marrakech, and wow. uh, so I took trips to show them the the Arab way of life in Morocco and that. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was fruitful because, you know, in the world of dogs, and you know as well as I, that you meet all these people and you meet, you have all these avenues that you can follow and it just enriches your life. Not only the dogs themselves, because, you know, when you're young uh, and I'm speaking from uh, a point now that I'm I'm older, but yeah. when you're young, you need a guiding force, and you need something to take care of. And if it wasn't for dogs, I don't know where I would be in my life. And it that because life. there were some, they were something that I had to take care of. That I had a motivational force to go home, take care of, and I had a direction. And a lot a of passion. young people, yes, a, a lot of young people now don't have that direction and I, you know i'm saying this from a point that i'm an educator because i taught on the high school the uh college and graduate levels and uh you know i see every day and i still go into the schools every day because i'm a substitute teacher wow. and um i see a lot of children without uh, direction yeah. And I see a lot of children that come from the inner city who, who because of the zoning laws and, and apartment laws and things like that, are not able to have a canine friend. And let me tell you something. I, you know, I had a brilliant career in, in education. I was department chairman of world languages for a school system east of Cleveland. And every time I would bring my dogs into the classroom, the most bullish student melted animals have that way of bringing out the sincerity the empathy and that it's a wonder to look at it's a wonder to experience so great to mention that. i'm and sorry think, about talking so much no here. no 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 i want you to just keep going because i think that's like something that's so key is that like your life and dogs is not about a ribbon or an accomplishment or a record it's about these moments and these connections with these people in you're, different places that you never would have had if it wasn't for those dogs you're absolutely right and 
you know, the love, once you lose that love of dogs mm. and, and only look at records, then you've lost something in the transla translation. Now, it's okay to make records and things like that. You know, it's wonderful to do that. Sure. And I applaud the people who are able to do that. But sure. you need to go back to the basis and why we are in dogs and it's for dogs it's them themselves because a lot of people lose their way in this in this whole yeah. sport right and especially when you're thinking of it for a lot of people it's their livelihood so they think they have to put on their business hat and they have to look at bottom lines and you know you can get you can get distracted from that initial passion that initial connection with those dogs mm -hmm. just as your pet let alone what they do in the show ring Right, exactly. I agree with you 100%. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I think especially, too, you know, a big thing we've been talking about is the younger group in the sport of dogs and how people can get more engagement um, and, and kind of showcase that opportunity for younger people. Have you seen an opportunity in your role as an educator to guide people to dogs or to your life in dogs in any way? Oh, certainly. And, I, you know... Uh, <laughs> I am, and I've been very fortunate to be president of a, an all-breed club. Mm. I'm also president of the Cuyahoga Valley Hound Association. And I can remember one fateful day in my classroom, I was trying to figure out how am I going to get all this stuff done for my show. I had two individuals in my, in my class, and I said, listen, guys, why don't you come to our dog show? You can work. I'll put you both up in a hotel and you can just drive into the show site and you can help me out. Well, they did it for five years straight. <laughs> no way. That's yes. Amazing. Yes. And they now have dogs there of their own. Wow. And yes. And it's re and a plus, you know, one of them's a doctor that lives on the East Coast now. He, he went through uh, uh, basic training, I believe, in the Navy and that. And the other one's an accountant here in Cleveland. And uh, I was very happy and, and felt very good that we were able not only to foster their their interest in dogs, Yes. but also to help them out with their college studies because they would do this. Our shows are in the summer. They do this in the summer to gain yeah. money for their college. And yes. what better way to do that? Now, to carry this further, in our kennel club, what we do is this. Um, we have junior showmanship every day, and we pick a best junior each day. On the final day, we have a tournament. And we go ahead and we, uh, we have a judge, probably a, a visiting judge, uh, somebody that doesn't know anybody, pick out of the uh, four days and the five shows that we put on in the four days, the best in tournament. Hmm. And that person gets a $500 scholarship. It's and the fabulous. reserve, the reserve gets a $250 uh, scholarship to a college that they want to go to. That's so we've amazing. carried that on, too, to stimulate the, the uh, not only the, the love of dogs and their continuance in the sport, uh, but also to help them out in life. Because right. we need people who have degrees or are going into an occupational uh uh, venture right. and so they are set in life so they can go ahead and and afford the dog show sport and you know as well as i do it's not cheap not cheap right and if you're not doing it every weekend as a professional handler it's hard to find a way to make that happen while you're starting a career exactly exactly so you know we we're trying to look at every avenue that we can in yeah. order to stimulate the younger people to be interested and we have we have junior members we have a junior membership in our kennel clubs and we have we have several junior members and, and it, it, it's wonderful it's just wonderful to that, see that is really amazing i think that's a great kind of 
point for people to think about there are opportunities in you know in their workplace in their you know neighborhoods and professions how they can involve somebody who has nothing to do with dogs and the mm -hmm. opportunity that's there even if it's somebody who's not necessarily going to get involved in the sport but even if it's just to provide an economic opportunity for somebody exactly now you know to carry this if if i may continue with go this ahead day, yeah you know, since I'm retired, I'm still in the educational process because I substitute for several districts here. Mm -hmm. And one fateful day, I, I, I substituted in a, uh, a cognitive disability unit. And sometimes these are students who are lost in the school that they don't, don't have... Uh, you know, the ability to be placed with the other mainstream students and that, and I was really touched because these are really terrific individuals. They have a difficulty in, in the learning process because of, of certain things. Yeah. And I said to them, and I also got her teacher aside and I said to them, look at, you know, uh, I get stacks and stacks and stacks of dog show magazines. And, you know, to be quite honest, sometimes I don't even open them up. <laughs> and and I, I, I shouldn't say this, but please don't tell the magazine publishers <laughs> this. But, Your but, secret's safe with me. <laughs> okay, good, wonderful. And the people are watching this, I'm sure. But, right. but the thing is, is that I said, you know, let's bring these magazines into the classroom. And the teacher says, you know what we can do? We can make a collage. And I said, great, great, because with this collage, what I would like to do is take a picture of the students with their collage and go ahead and maybe send it to the magazine so they can do, we can do an article on this because we're bringing dogs into the classroom to a group of individuals uh, that normally are lost in the process right. and uh, they went ahead and did their collages i haven't taken the pictures yet in that but i got a couple other magazines and i'm flipping through it and of course i see a couple of my pictures in these <laughs> magazines i said let's not stop here <laughs> what we're going to do is i'm it's like find waldo <laughs> so they're going to find david miller in the oh magazine and the first person who finds me in both magazines will get a prize. <laughs> so so what I, I did this, and at the end of the day, the teacher comes to me and says, well, there's one girl in the classroom, Maggie, and, and she found you in both magazines. And I said, you know, if I'm in this building tomorrow, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring her a surprise. Well, I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to bring her? What am I going to bring her? And so I thought, you know, last time I was in Singapore, it had just become the, the year of the dog. So they had these little Chinese dogs, stuffed Chinese yeah, dogs. Yeah, yeah. And I had about five or six of them because I passed them out to some of the Kennel Club members. So yeah. I bought her in that, and she was just ecstatic. Oh. Just so ecstatic. touching. Oh, so, so wonderful. You know, it, it's... It's wonderful to be able to bring this knowledge. Yeah. And they're looking at the magazines and they're saying, oh, I know what kind of dog this is. And that, and we're furthering the process yes. and that. So, and not only that, because before I would, uh, some of the school systems that would come in, I would take the dog magazines to the library mm. and they would put the dog magazines out and, and the students would go ahead and look through them. And that's so we're we're spreading right. the knowledge and visibility. That. And I think one thing that's really hitting me as you're talking is, you know, you mentioned how when you were young, it gave you purpose and direction. And it's still I can see it clearly still is even to this day. Yes, yes. Well, you, you know, it is. And of course, you always want to share something that's worked out with you. And that's always very, very important uh, because, uh, you know, if we don't share, we we don't see the wonder in other people. Yes, and why how, hoard it all for yourself when others can have it as well? Exactly, exactly. So it, it's good. brought a lot of happiness and and fulfillment in my life to be able to to spread the knowledge and and do things like this for for students and um, and other people. 
Mm. It's so much more than just the dogs, right? So much more. So much more because you're touching lives. Yes. Yes. Let's let's wrap up with what would be some of your most poignant mem memories in the sport. It could be judging, could be showing, could be an interaction, a relationship. What oh, comes to mind? Wow. Well, starting on the base is, you know, when you're first starting, it's getting your first point, yeah. getting your first major, getting yeah. your first best of breed, <laughs> you know, getting your first group placement right on up. You know, it, it, that's, right. that's a, a personal pleasure in, in, the, in the dog world. You know, the dog world's criticized a lot. They say politics, 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 and all this and that. And, you know, it's in every sport. Yeah, but something happened to me, and I, I've been very fortunate because I judge a lot uh, in in all over the world, mm -hmm. and I was judging at the uh, World Dog Show in China, and I was fortunate to have enough to judge Pomeranians there, and it was a relatively new breed because a toy group is a new breed for me, and I, you know, I was really sweating it because I'm very different than Pomeranians. Have Pomeranians from all over the world. David, you better be <laughs> on the spot. Yeah. So I put up a dog for best of breed, and we're taking pictures, and you know, I I, I thought it was just beautiful just beautiful and so as we're taking pictures i i tell the owner i say i said to the, him you know you should come and show at our show the owners from china yeah. should come and show at our show because we have a supported entry in pomeranians mm. well our shows come up and who do i see there <laughs> the listen. dog the first day takes best of breed over the specials. <laughs> takes a group first and takes best in show. <laughs> I, I was standing outside so the my the mouth, my jaw dropped. I, I couldn't believe this because you know, best in show is something like we all want to do in our lives. Especially but for an here, unknown dog. Yes. And it happened the next day. The dog had finished his championship, went best in show. The third day, took a group place. The fourth day, reserved best in show. Well, you know, I, I, I'm ecstatic because plus it also rekindles another thing that is that rekindles your faith in dog shows. That if you have a wonderful specimen of a breed, you're going to win. You're great. going to win. Eventually, you're going to win. And that's right. good for me. If I may go on with the go story ahead. a little further, the dog went to, uh, later on in November, went to Italy in one of Italy's biggest shows. I've judged that show. It's uh, Francesco Cocchetti's show in, in Rome. Mm -hmm. And the dog took best in show there. <laughs> then he comes to Westminster. The dog takes the breed. <laughs> And then <laughs> COVID starts. Oh. He went up to, he couldn't leave to go back to China. So he went up to Canada, stayed with some friends in Canada, and then made it back into the United States to the Palm Specialty. Takes mm -hmm. best of breed at the American Palm Specialty. How wonderful is that? <laughs> that is really beautiful. I mean, and especially to be able to do that in so many different countries where people don't know who you are, who the dog is. Exactly. And also that somebody who can learn dogs from a totally different group of people. Right. And never have an interaction and still come up with the same dog, I think is pretty impressive. Yes, yes. And, you know, that has rekindled my faith in the sport in, in a lot of ways. I and that. I think it's just wonderful that a good specimen will always, will always do well. And it's so cool to have that happen for you, especially with a breed that's so different than what your start and your foundation and your kind of initial passion was. You know, Michael, you're, 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 you're right because, you know, when you enter a new group, you're a stranger in a strange land. 
<laughs> and you have to navigate it. And you, the way you navigate it is to really sit down and look at that standard, try to digest it, and try to, you know, judging is an intelligence. Mm. And in education, we have what we call the uh, Gardner's theory of intelligences, because there's so many intelligences that you have to cultivate in the classroom. But here, you're using application. Hmm. And application intelligence is on the higher level. Because, and with a limited period of time, too. Right. Oh, for sure. And within, what, uh, less than three minutes, a dog? And right. you're taking that standard and remembering things from the standard and trying to apply it to what you have in front of you. Right. So it is a higher form of intelligence to judge. Mm -hmm. And that, and uh, of course, you have your standard and that, and, and that's what you have to go by. Oh. <laughs> well, David, I think we should do a couple more videos because there's a lot to talk about you with. But for now, I just really well, there is, there is. <laughs> sharing Michael, about I, this. It's for me to thank you to have me on your, your program. And I, I certainly would love to come back and we could talk even more. I've already got more ideas, so stand by. <laughs> Wonderful. Listen, thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. Stay safe and hope to see you soon. You as well. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.